pH and health, and what that has to do with our health. Um, when we talk about health, we're all in agreement that uh, health takes a little bit of effort, right? You know, I think when we talk about health, we're either going uphill or downhill with our health. And you can't coast, because if you're, going, if you're coasting, you're going downhill. Um, you know, so I, I think something that helps with our path of health is knowledge of choices, of information, of things that can help us uh, find the right path to try to maximize and reach our true health potential. And so we've talked, we've had our different subjects with dinner with the docs, and tonight I'm going to talk about pH and uh, how that affects our health, acid and alkaline. So, something else I was thinking about as I was putting all this stuff together, there's something really wrong in the world of healthcare. The contradiction of calling and practicing sick care as healthcare is literally killing our culture. So many people, your coworkers and neighbors and um, friends and even family, they think of healthcare as what happens the majority of the time in the medical community. And uh, I would disagree. I think that in the medical community, they are amazing at acute care, crisis care situations. If I got in an accident, then that would be really bad, and I would need a lot of help you know, to be patched up and put back together. But when it comes to health and wellness, and wellness care, or health care, the way I think about health care and wellness care, it doesn't happen with pills, potions, and lotions. It happens from lifestyle choices, and making shifts in lifestyle choices, so we're giving our body what it expects and requires to achieve optimal health potential. And so you got to think at all times, am I treating the cause or am I treating the effect? And even when we talk about natural things, a lot of times people are looking at natural, especially supplementation and different things like that, like what can I take naturally or what can I, you know, something that I can administer to help me with this condition. That's still, in my opinion, part of like a, it's a medical treatment model. You know, it all has to come back to the foundations first of what we're choosing with how our body's functioning with the nervous system, our eating and our nutrition, our motion and our movement, and our thoughts in our head. And that's what designs or what I think builds the equation of health. So there are times that we're going to need some nutritional supplementation to help facilitate and uh, increase our body's potential for health. But it's really got to be the practice of um, the bare bones, basics, and fundamentals. So are we treating the cause or treating the effects? Okay, what is the primary medium that delivers oxygen and nutrients to your body? Guess is what's, what, what in our body delivers oxygen and nutrients to our cells? Our blood. blood. Our blood. Yep. So the blood. And the blood is the river of life. It, it takes uh, the nutrients and the oxygen to the tissues. And that's something that our cells need is nutrients. It needs to be it needs to be able to eliminate waste, and um, it's very important the makeup of our blood to get the nutrients to our cells efficiently. So then our cells can do what they're designed to do, so they can be healthy, not sick. What is the primary medium for eliminating waste in our body? Guesses? Blood. No. The lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is our, our trash trucks, and that's what takes waste away from our cells. So our blood system, the circulatory system, has a pump. It's called the heart. Our lymphatic system has no pump. Our lymphatic system only moves when <coughs> we move. Okay? Through your motion and your movement of your muscles, that's what moves our uh, lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system works closely with the circulatory system as it cleans and returns the tissue that surrounds and bathes our cells and destroys toxins that enter the body and then the body it has three times more lymph than it has blood. There's a lot of lymph. And so the tough part for many is because of technology and that they're so sedentary with work. I talk about the box lifestyle. They wake up and they hit the box next to the bed, and then they eat their cereal out of a box, and they watch TV, the box, the TV, and they ride to work in a box, and they type on a box, and they sit in a box, 
in the cubicle, and then they get in their box to go to lunch, and they eat a box lunch, and they go back to their box job and their box cubicle, and, and then they go home, and they sit down in front of the box, and they eat a box dinner, many times a very uh, enzyme-robbed, nutrient-robbed, you know, um, processed box dinner, and uh, then maybe they have a cylinder at the end of the day to wind it all down, but it's a very box lifestyle. And with, with that lifestyle, there's not much motion. And uh, Dr. Ross talked about his ergonomics on one of his talks, and I've heard just recently, it just depends on who you read when they talk about how many hours of a day the average American is idle, is scary. Because the last time I checked, there was 24 hours in a day. And some studies show that the average American sits or is idle 23 hours a day. Because you sleep all night, they get up and walk to the shower that's 20 seconds away, shower and whatever, and then sit in the car to go to work, get up from the parking lot to get into work and sit all day long, get up from sitting all day all morning long and then get to a car, and ride to a car to lunch somewhere and sit to eat lunch, and ride in the car back, and you see how that adds up to those, just those minor minutes and seconds, how that can take a lot to get to the hour, 23 hours a day of uh, idleness. So when we talk about pH, pH, maintaining pH balance in the body has become an important subject of modern health research and is being concluded that general wellness is uh, uh, predicted upon it. The body is able to self-regulate as long as it's receiving an alkaline-rich diet, and we're going to get into that further. Different research that's been done in the past, this Dr. John Solomon, uh, John Hopkins University, he was one of the first to work with acid-base balance 20 years ago, focused on a, a homeostatic balance. So our body's always fighting for homeostasis. Homeostasis is a balance within the body. And your, your body, honestly, we are mammal, and there's two things that mammals do, their job, to survive and reproduce. That's it. Survive and reproduce. And our body's really kind of doing the same thing. It's always fighting <clears throat> to survive and reproduce. No matter what we do to it, through nutrition or lack of exercise or, or whatever happens, our body's always trying to fight for survival. And it's trying to fight survival so it can reproduce. Dr. Alex Guerrero, peak performance athletes and termi terminally uh, ill patients. He treated over 500 terminally ill patients. After five years, 85% are still alive, and he was working with pH of the body, making a shift in people's health in a short amount of time by uh, working with pH of the body. So this chemistry thing, pH, where does it come from? What does this mean? I remember back in um, even high school chemistry, we did an experiment where they took some clear uh, liquids, I don't remember what they all were, like a water and an alcohol and ammonia and maybe a vinegar and there was a certain order that you put this stuff in there and you used an eyedropper in a beaker and you dropped and dropped and dropped and you had to count the drops. One, two, three, and you would count the drops and at a certain number the whole solution turned pink because of the saturation and the whole thing like that. Which drop made the solution turn pink? Was it the last drop? Was it the first drop? Was it all the drops accumulated that created this chemical experiment that we were learning from? And that's what happens with our body too. It's not just the first time you know we're putting poor things in our body, it's not the last time where this certain person presents with a symptom. Oh my gosh, I have this symptom. Well yeah, the symptom just started today, this, the, the sign of the symptom or the presenting complaint, but when did it all start? It's been accumulating over time, right? And that's why, that's when the people go into emergency mode they go into emergency mode at that time, and that's when um, they want to solve their problem. And they want a quick fix because they want their problem gone now. And that's what's led into a lot of, um, you know, the today's standard of healthcare because we live in such a fast food, fast paced microwave society that people want uh, uh, relief or they want results right now. So the food that we choose makes our body's chemistry, okay? Makes it good or makes it bad, makes it acid or alkalinity. The body's unique system of cells coordinated by our nervous system, 100 trillion cells, 100 trillion cells in our body, creating 10 trillion chemical processes every second. That's amazing. The 100 trillion cells, that's one thing, but then when I think about what happens every second, 10 trillion chemical processes every, every second. Chemistry makes our electrical balance in our body. So the nervous system, it works like an electrical system. We've talked about that and the brain being the main control panel and then coming down from that, the spinal cord and out the spinal nerves. 
That's in a, like an electrical system, it's, it controls everything in our body. Well, that uses electrical impulses as well to run that uh, nerve potential, that action potential down the nerve and to make everything work. So the chemistry of pH even plays a, a big part and a big role of how efficiently our body works, all the way down to the cellular level. Our body's chemistry is measured, measured in pH, and acid breaks down our chemistry. Okay, uh, maintaining our pH is as important to our bodies as maintaining our temperature. And so, again, as far as when we talk about homeostasis or balance, you know, our temperature is in balance. We want different um, uh, factors with our blood in balance, and our pH is extremely important. And the blood, our river of life, that takes its, the oxygen and nutrients to all our cells, and that's what our cells need is oxygen and nutrients to thrive, and what gives our body energy, its pH has to be 3.6 or 7.36. Has to be, and this is where a lot of times in the medical community pH gets kind of poo-pooed, and the reason why is because they check the pH of the blood, and the body will do everything it can do to survive. Okay, and so the pH in the blood can't change much from 7.36. It has to stay that way, and your body goes into survival mode to keep it that way. So it does all kinds of things with your tissues to take the acid away from the blood to keep the blood at 7.36. We'll get a little bit more into that in a second. So remember, uh, the blood's what takes the oxygen from the uh, <clears throat> nutrients to the cells. So pH, what's pH got to do with it? So when we talk about pH, that's acid and alkaline. Acid is zero. On the other extreme end of the scale is called alkalinity or alkaline, and that's 14 when we measure this pH. And neutral would be halfway, which is 7. So that's neutral. The blood pH is 7.36, so it's slightly alkaline. Neutral, but just a touch slightly alkaline. That's where our body wants to bathe. And we can talk about pH with all kinds of stuff. We can talk about pH with an aquarium. We can talk about pH with the farmer's soil and things that he does to the soil to help the pH of his soil to get a better yield of crop off his soil. pH is extremely important in the environment. Um, like a pond, when they test farm, they, they DNR checks ponds, they're testing pH. So tissue pH, our tissue pH in a healthy state is between 6.6 .6 and 7.4. When your body metabolizes things like omega-6 fats, vegetable oils, grain-fed protein, simple sugars, high fructose corn syrup, processed foods, acid products remain. That's what drives acid into your body is uh, um, foods of this source and um, when it drives that acid in your body it puts your body into the survival mode so the delicate mach machinery of our body does not work well in acidic state it makes the body work harder to try to restore and maintain balance the cellular machinery is balanced to work best within a narrow slightly alkaline range 6.6 .6 to 7.4 as far as the tissue pH and 7.36 as far as our blood. So what happens when all this happens, when this whole thing happens, when we have acid into our body? So let's take, for example, uh, a Coke or a Pepsi. Let me look real quick. I'll give you some of these numbers later, but uh, Coke. pH. Anybody got a guess what the pH of Coke is? Three. Actually, this study that I read said 2.5, but I've read 3 and 3.1. So it just depends on who I read, and I don't know for sure why they don't know exactly. Why can I see 2.525, and why can I see 3.1 is what I've typically taught in the past. So this is one that I just saw, so about 3. We talk about battery acid, battery acid is 1. When we talk about going from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 3, it's not a 1 increment, it's 10 times. It's a logarithmic scale. So from if, if we're supposed to be 6.6 .6 to 7.4 and someone's checking their tissue pH and you're like 5.5 something, you're, you're 10 times more acidic than you should be. Not 1, you're not 1 away, you're 10 times away. So what happens when acid gets in our body like a Coke, let's call it 3.0 or a, or a 2.5 or whatever we figure out, it's, it's acidic. You can be with me on that. So the body goes into survival mode and when it gets into the blood, what happens is those red blood cells have a negative charge on the outside of them. And they have a negative charge on the outside of them because the negatives repel each other. It makes them not stick together. And they have to do that because that makes them move very fast through our body. And our body has, the, in the circulatory system, we have arteries, we have veins, and what's the thing that connects arteries to veins? What do you call those? Capillaries. So the capillaries are very, very small. And do you know the red blood cells actually have to line up single file to get through the capillaries to move from the arteries to the vein? So that's why you want these things to repel each other. You want them to move very fast, and they've got to be very, um, they, they can't stick together. 
what happens is when we have acid get into the blood, what it'll do is it'll strip that negative charge off the outside of the red blood cell. And that's bad because it causes the red blood cell to stick together, like sludge. And you can look at studies where they do whole blood analysis, and you can actually see this happening as these red blood cells are stuck together. How do you think the red blood cells work going through capillaries when they're all stuck together like a clump? Like sludge, not very good, right? And so that decreases the efficiency of the red blood cells getting oxygen and nutrients to your cells. What do you think that does for your body's energy when you're not getting the proper amount of oxygen and nutrients to your cells? Your energy goes through the floor. <coughs> so, red blood cells have negative charge, keep them from sticking together, as the charge is stripped, cause red blood cells to come together. The inside of the red blood cell has a positive charge. So what happens is, is this acidic state happens around the blood, around the red blood cells. It strips that negative charge off the outside of the cell membrane and it makes him weak and then it actually can cause him to explode. And so then it compounds and it dumps more toxicity into this river of life. It just builds on top of each other. So they release their own acids, now the environment's even more polluted. When that happens, your blood, the state of your blood is becoming in trouble. Because remember, your body has to do survival and reproduce. That's what your body wants to do. And so when it goes in survival mode, it says, I need to get this acid out of my blood. And so it pushes it to your tissues. It actually pushes it to your fat, more, m mostly. And so in most states, the problem is the people really aren't, they're over fat, but they're over fat because they're over acid. And the body's going to hang on to that fat as a survival mode to keep that toxicity away from their vital tissues as long as the body stays in an acidic state. So a person can decide, I want to make a shift in my health, I'm going to exercise really hard and do this, but they don't make the right shift in their nutrition, no matter how hard they work, their body's not going to rid all the fat. You're going to store fat still. Because your body's in survival mode. Your body's smart, not stupid, right? We've talked about that, and it's going to hang on to this fat. It also goes to the weakest parts of your body. So if maybe you had an organ in tissue, uh, in, an organ in trouble, or tissues in trouble, that acid will go there too. Because it is just, it's a less, it, it, he doesn't have the fight <coughs> that a healthy tissue or a healthy uh, organ has. And so let's say if you have subluxation, is decreasing the nerve potential to a certain organ, that organ's in trouble, and then if you're acidic in your choice of nutrition, and you're overall in that acid state, then your body's going to push that acid to that weakened organ and create more havoc on that organ. So now the body takes the acid, stores it in the fat to protect the vital organs. Then what happens is when that acid's in the blood and it's trying to push it into uh, your fat and push it into all these different places, your body says, oh my gosh, this is bad, and it starts drawing alkaline buffers out of your body. That's calcium out of your bones, magnesium out of your cells, and pot potassium out of your tissues, because they're a positive charge. And so what they do is they try to neutralize this acidic state. What would you call a condition if you're drawing calcium out of the bones for a long period of time? What would you cause to call that condition? osteoporosis or osteopenia. So then they go and you can have your T-scores tested and things like this and they can say, hey, we've checked this out and it shows that you're osteopenia or osteoporotic. And we're going to give you this medication that, whatever, makes your bones stronger. They don't. Was the deficiency in the medication the cause? No. What was the cause? The acidic state over a period of time because your body's leaching this calcium out of your bones to try to buffer the acidity. So, um, it kind of brings me into the milk discussion, you know, oh, I get your calcium, I get your milk, and stuff like that, and we, we've talked before that uh, in the United States we consume more dairy than any other nation on this planet, and we have the highest rate of osteoporosis. One of the other things that happens with dairy is it actually brings an acidic load in the body. And so what happens is your body has to hook these alkaline uh, buffers to the acid to help excrete it through the kidneys, the bladder, and the ureters to protect the soft tissues within those organs. That's one of the reasons why it's doing it. Not only to protect your blood, but also to protect the organs that it has to excrete this toxicity out of. So then the other thing that happens is your acid draws water out of your tissues. So when you have um, 
this acidic state within the blood and the tissues and everything else, it'll actually pull water from places like joints and other tissues. And so that's what creates a lot of times joint pain is because of an acidic state in the body. And then these acidic uh, crystals can uh, accumulate and cause more of the osteoarthritis and things like this with the joints because of the acidic state. So it can also dehydrate the body because if it's pulling water, because also you need water to run vital functions. When we study like Krebs cycle and glycolysis and different things like this, it uses and breaks water bonds to make energy, H2O. It's just part of the, it's part of the chemistry that breaks this water bond. And so when you're in an acidic state and your body's pulling your water out of your joints and tissues to help push the acid out of your body, wants to get it out and excrete the waste, then it can create more of a dehydrated state within your body. And most Americans are dehydrated in the first place because of their choices of not drinking enough water and drinking too much caffeine. So again, it's just adding more fuel to the fire of a lack of homeostatic environment within the body. The body now is pushed even harder into survival mode. In an acidic state, the body has loss, loss of resilience in its repair mechanisms. You become more susceptible to fatigue, illness, and pain. When your body tries to remove excess acids, critical minerals are lost as well. The minerals protect your kidneys, bladder, and ureters from acidic damage. So if you had uh, this acid running through your arteries and your body can't keep up, then the acid, if you had acid running through like a garden hose, it would start to burn through the hose, right? And that's no good, because what if you had holes in your arteries? That'd be no good at all. So then your body goes into more of a protective survival mode, and then it starts taking the free-floating free, free floating <coughs> cholesterol, and then again, placking the scarring, if you will, that we've talked about before, when we talked about omega-6 toxic diet that's inflammatory, and then creates this scratching, scarring, or scraping of the... Uh, of the lumen of the internal wall of the blood vessel, it takes that cholesterol and it dumps it in there to create a plaque or a scar of this injured vessel. And just real quick to review on that, it's it's not the LDL's fault. So remember we talked, what's the what's the name of the bad cholesterol? LDL. And what's the name of the good cholesterol? HDL. And then I said wrong, that's not it. The LDL's there for a reason. They're both good cholesterols. But what happens is LDL is uh, the cholesterol that take, or I'm sorry, the carrier, it's low density lipoprotein that carries cholesterol away from the liver. And HDL, high density lipoprotein, is what brings cholesterol back to the liver. And so what happens is, is these, uh, the LDL is what carries your cholesterol away. And so your LDLs go up because your body's in survival mode, so it's carrying more LDLs to the area to protect and lay down this cholesterol to protect the uh, Vessel. So that's the problem there. So then, when you have the blood in an acidic state, other things happen in this pond, if you will, in this in this pond environment. Yeast molds and fungus build up in the blood, and these yeast molds and fungus build up in an acidic state because it's a, it's a safe place for them to live. And then what happens is the yeast that's living in your blood then eats all your glucose which is your energy stores and any, any glucose you're taking in good, I mean glucose, sugar is good for us in different ways, you know, so it's your glucose is your energy, but your, the yeast and these freeloaders are eating up your glycogen stores and then you keep on eating and eating and you're never satisfied because you're feeding the yeast and the freeloaders. So until you change to a net alkaline state, there's a lot of um, poor balance going on in the body and your body's getting weaker, not stronger. Agree? So then it also burdens your immune system because now your body's burned up all this extra uh, its energy and its body's reserves and it's been a continuous state of stress. So then it starts just creating more distress signals and gets into the cortisol, adrenaline, and insulin stuff, which is hormonal storm. And Dr. Fever talked about that stuff when he talked about the stress response to the body and how that can create havoc on the body because your body can't differentiate between stresses. If it's the stress of the bear attack or coming after you while you're gathering your berries in the woods, or if it's an acidic state of your body, or if it's uh, an emotional stress or anything like that, your body physiologically does the same thing. Your adrenal glands produce cortisol, adrenaline, and norepinephrine. 
When that's in your body, and if you don't burn off these uh, chemicals, then it, uh, attach, it affects your thyroid and shuts your thyroid down. It affects your sex hormones and shuts your sex hormones down. It affects your insulin and your glucagon, so that creates this whole hormonal storm within your body. The physiological response to these distress messengers is more acid enhancing. So it's just more compounding within this system. So the people that say, oh, you know, I just got to have my vice, you know, I got to have, you can't take everything away from me, I got to have my <laughs> Coke every day, I'm just having one, you know, just every day, that's all I need. You know, I've said, is it okay to have a small oil leak in the Gulf? I mean, you're putting toxicity into it, is it is that, that's okay just to put toxicity to it every day? It's bad to have an oil leak in the Gulf, no matter if it's small or big. Is it okay to take a little bit of Coke in every day? Just, I'm just putting this in my environment just a little bit every day. Don't you understand that that is very, very bad for your body? Further increasing the total acid load that the body has to handle. So what do we do about it? Nothing tastes as good as fit, vital, alive, and full of energy feels. You are the author of your own circumstances. You choose what you buy at the grocery store and what you stock in your house. You choose what you eat at every one of your meals. It's okay to treat yourself and have acidic stuff at times, but make it stuff that you have to go out of the house for. Stock your house with stuff that is real and from the earth. Vegetable, fruits, berries, nuts, seeds, and good clean protein. And if you want to go get some ice cream, get in the car, the whole family, and go get some ice cream. It's okay. But don't keep it in your house. Because you know what's going to happen when it's there? You're going to eat it. And it's going to make you sick. And it's going to affect your health. So you live and die by what you stock and what you keep in your house and your cupboards. But it's it's okay to uh, <coughs> treat yourself. And it's you, and then I talk about making up your equation. So again, uh, if we're eating six meals a day, seven days a week, remember how many meals is that a week? Forty-two. And so pick the percentage that you want to play your lifestyle by. If it's ninety ten, that means four point two meals of the week. You can do whatever you want to do. And that's okay, and I don't care. If you want to go 80-20, and you have eight meals a week, that sounds like a lot to me, eight meals, but that's still okay. That means 80% of the week you're doing amazing with your nutrition and what you're putting in your body and giving your cells what they expect and require. Do you think your body's going to be more closer to health or further away if you do that? I think it's going to be more closer to health than the person that's not making any good choices at all. So it's time to get a good woman. Woman. Water. <laughs> Superhydrate. you got to superhydrate your body. That is a big deal when we talk about pH and acid and alkalinity is just hydration of the body. Hey, drinking water can alkalize your body. And drinking water with lemon or lime or something like that squished into it can better alkalize your body. There's the um, different components and, and deals that these people have with ionized water and different alkalized water. That I don't do that. I do reverse osmosis uh, water. But that's okay if you wanted to do something like that too. You know, but it, at our house, you know, we just drink clean water, you know, filtered reversed osmosis water. Um, but then when I'm out, you know, for lunch when I drink water, they always have lemon slices there. So I crunch a couple of those in my water as I'm eating my alkaline rich foods. Oxygen. Oxygen helps alkalize the body and help rid the body of acidity. And that comes from deep diaphragmatic breaths and remembering to do that during our day. Most people breathe with their scalenes, which are muscles of their neck, and that only uses the top third of their lungs. But when you take a deep diaphragmatic breath and really think about the inhale and holding it, and exhale, you utilize and use the whole lung, and it brings oxygen to your brain, and that's energy. And then through exercise, obviously in exercise, you're gonna increase your respirations, and you're gonna bring more oxygen to your body and getting good minerals, which we're gonna get through our nutrition, you know, through good organically grown things that come from the soil, because that's where your minerals are gonna come from, you know, and good clean uh, animals that eat from the real earth, you know, and not uh, grain-fed, industrialized, antibiotic, hormone pumped, sick. <laughs> that was gonna get nasty. <laughs> alkalinity, we got to concentrate on alkalinity, and that's really from veg and fruits. And so when we talk about food pyramid, and we talk about the ratios and our percentages, I guess, of the day, the number one on mine is the foundation of my pyramid. When I think about my pyramid, is water. Half an ounce of water per pound of body weight minimum. 
That's what our body's going to use as we sit here in this chair or if we lay on the couch all day or whatever to respirate and make blood and hormones and, and cellular uh, chemical reactions and everything it does. So a half an ounce of water per pound of body weight minimum and then when we exercise it's got to be more than that because you're using more water. So that's the minimum. Um, well, the rest of my food for me. So then up from there, um, and again, this is where I've always kind of preached in the past, don't get mad at me when my recommendations change from year to year, and, and, and because as I just try to read and just understand the most that I can, a little, the way I've changed is I want to take in a little more protein than what I was recommending before. And so before I talk about maybe 60% alkaline uh, driving foods, your veg and, and fruits, and probably 60% of that being veg and 40% of that being fruits. But the more I read about paleo and hunter and gather and our ancestors, they didn't have a copious amount of um, fruits and veg. But they ate a lot of wild protein, you know, wild animals. And we've talked about how they, they've eaten the brains and they eat the stomach and they, they eat all that. It's got I mean, just amazing nutrients in there. But when then we talk about uh, blue zones, and I read about the blue zones, which are the concentrations of tribes, if you will, or uh, today's day, some hunter and gatherers, but a lot of them just tri tribes of people and what they consume. Um, a lot of that is still very uh, clean, protein rich diet. And so I think with every meal, every time I eat, I think I should have within that meal a plant, mm -hmm. a fat, and a protein. Does that make sense? A plant, a fat, and a protein. And so I'm okay if that protein's from nuts or seeds, you know, like if it's snack. But for breakfast, you know, your oats are going to give you some protein too, and that, that's good stuff if you're doing oatmeal. But I'm a big fan of uh, cage-free eggs for protein. And the whole thing, you know, the yolk as well. But there's good, uh, very, very good nutrients in that for us. But if I'm going to do that, then I have to have plant, which would be a fruit or a veg. I don't care either one, you know, along with an omelet or just a sliced up fruit or a fruit smoothie or a smoothie even, even better with some spinach leaves in it and stuff like that. And then the fat would also come from the, the egg in that case. But then for a mid-morning snack, if I'm doing some almonds and uh, another piece of fruit or something, I'm getting it right there again. So I'm getting the good essential fatty acids, omega-3s and omega-9s, and then I'm getting protein from the nut, and then I'm also getting plant. So then for lunchtime, you know, if you want to do your protein on top of uh, a bed of greens, so like a salad, if you will, um, then I think that's a great way to go there. And I would add things like avocados and nuts on, and seeds on top of the salad to add even more fat. You know, but you're going to get good essential fatty acids from your, uh, if you're choosing from a clean source, chicken, beef, wild-caught fish, and, uh, or eggs, you know, hard-boiled eggs or something like that on a salad. So always think about that. And that's what the nourishment part of it is too. Not only nourishment through nutrition and choosing the good alkaline rich um, foods, but I think also new nourishment through, through spiritual and nourishment through relationships. And, and that has a lot to do because remember how I talked about the stress and how some of these just chemical reactions that we're causing to our body and then that creates our uh, physiological stress responses to kick in and adds more acid to the environment. Also, the way we think and, and our emotions and having good relationships with our tribe around us, you know, and helping out with others and others then helping us, there's something to that as well. So I think that nourishment just in our, our relationships is huge. So then one of the other things that I've talked about is a cleanse. So because what, what's one of the quickest ways I can go from a net acid body to a net alkaline body is to do a cleanse because it's detoxifying your body. Now you can just decide, you know, hey, I'm going to make a shift and I'm going to go, I'm going to go 80-20 and I'm going to see if I can do this and I'm going to spell out and calendar out my week and I'm going to plan the meals that I'm going to do, my, the stuff that maybe you, you, I don't know if you want to say you really like, but the things that are maybe more traditional for you, you know, in your, in your diet, you know, like a pizza or something like that. It's okay. Plan it. Look at it. Look at it on your calendar and then go ahead and do that. But again, kind of pick the ratio or the percentage that you want to you wanna play by. And you could, you could make a shift in your body's uh, pH 
but it's better if you really if you really want to make a shift in your health to get after it and do a cleanse. I also think that cleanse came naturally this time of year in the springtime. So like our paleo hunter and gatherer guy, is he came out of the winter and I think he was eating more stored stuff, like especially just protein and meats and nuts and things like that, that is a little bit acid forming. And then as stuff started to sprout out of the ground, I'm assuming he probably ate more of this. So in his in environment and things that were there and available, his body naturally cleansed in this time of year, the spring time of year and into summer. So I think this is a great time of the year to do it. And so um, a cleanse helps detoxify your body. Then you can build off of that. With a strong base in place, you have the resources to deal with challenges and utilize them to grow stronger and build off that foundation. Creating a base, you must cleanse the poisons you've already ingested. And I think even from us just trying to be awesome with our diet, even myself, that I still cleanse once a year around this time of year. I haven't planned my week yet, but it'll be coming up soon as I, um, as I start to think about it. It's a 10-day cleanse is what I do. It's called the Ultimate Body Cleanse. And uh, you guys can find that either here or on the website. And it's, a, it's an incorporated part of a, a food, a modified food diet, along with different supplementation that helps detoxify the body with the liver cleanse and cellular cleanse and parasite cleanse and digestive cleanse and then glutamine to help make the gut wall stronger and these different nutrients to help the body cleanse. And then when we get all that done, we celebrate and reward ourselves. So we have to take time in life always as we're setting goals, you know, and we're going to set some really high goals sometimes, but if you don't stop and reward yourself and set yourself up to continue to win, then sometimes it gets really tough, right? You know, so maybe having step goals, and uh, and when you get to those step goals, then, then reward yourself, you know, celebrate that. It's a beautiful thing. Um, part of the journey to reaching optimum health is to celebrate how amazing you feel by setting new goals. Celebrating your vitality. Live with maximum energy. In an alkaline state, you're going to have tremendous energy. Fat melts off in an alkaline state. Your body doesn't want fat on your body. It's a toxic thing, actually, but it's going to, in its survival mechanism, with its innate intelligence, it's going to hang on to fat if your body's acidic. And so getting your body more to an alkaline state is going to uh, help you, and I think a lot of you maybe your health goals. How do you test your pH? We have pH strips, or you can get pH strips at uh, the pharmacy, and you want to do a first morning urine. So you want the tissues to have accumulated um, the fluids, basically, over a six to seven hour period. And so then you take the pH strips, and then it comes with a little color-coded deal, and then you pee on the pH strip, and then you check the colors right away to the pH colors, and you see where you're at. And tissue pH is 6.6 to 7.4, that's the range you want to be in. If you're below the 6.6, .6, you are acidic. 6.6 to 7.4. And your body can be too alkaline too, but that happens actually in a disease state. If your body is, you can float a day and be like up in the high 7s or 8s, but if you're consistently up that high, your body is actually catabolic and it's breaking down. That's not, that's, so it, it, you can, if someone was really high, then that's a different thing. 6.6 to 6.4 is our healthy range of tissue pH. And that's how we would test it. That's what I got for tonight. Yep. So I have tested some of the water mm -hmm. in cities. Yes. And I've even tested some of these bottled water. Yes. And I've found some of them to be 6.0, 6.5, mm -hmm. maybe a couple of them being 7 point. If, if I, for example, if I'm drinking city water that right. happens to be 6.0, what is that doing to my body? Is it, you know, you, you said a minute ago, got to have a half an ounce for your yeah. body weight. So it's um, some different things because I don't. It's 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 is slightly acidic, you know, or six because we're one. It's tissue six point six. I guess it's it's not slightly. It's ten times more than where it should be at seven. You know, because it's supposed to be neutral. Water actually, some of the stuff says seven point one seven, right in there, and so um, right, it's not good. We want our water to be more at a neutral 7 pH state. So it is creating more toxicity in our body, but it is also hydrating us. So if it's the, if it's the only choice I had at that time, hydration to me is probably more, I mean, pH, they're all important. Every way that I uh, evaluate the chemistry in my body is all important, but the hydrated state of my body, I think is super important meaning just having the water in there, you know what I'm saying? 
having the water in, rather than choosing, oh, I'm just not going to drink it because I brought my pH strips with me and I tested it in a sink, so I'm just not going to drink it. I'd rather have the hydration of my body. One of the things that I found out uh, looking up pH is that uh, some of the athletes, what they would do to their water is add baking soda to it. Mm -hmm. Baking soda is an alkaline. Yeah, to make it more alkaline. But it's also a salt, is it not? It is. And so then you talk about electrolytes and salts and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to go with just trying to choose pure water, not adding anything to it. So nothing as far as baking soda, nothing as far as crystal light to make it taste better because I just don't like the taste of water. I you have people tell me that. Are you kidding me? You don't like the taste of water? I love water. I crave water. I just don't understand when they say that, but I, I do understand. I mean, because they have their taste. So that's when I tell them, okay, let's squeeze the lemon, lime, or a slice of orange, or squeeze something in it to give it some taste. Please don't put the crystal light in there and the other little sack things that you can get, you know, the size of the deal to put in the water bottle, because that's toxic. What about the whole, with reverse osmosis, does that affect the fluoride in the water? Yes, and fluoride's a whole different deal, you know, I'm not a fan of fluoride. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, this is kind of like how we've been told this story about calcium. Correct. Same thing with fluoride in kids. So. Right. Yeah, so fluoride's a, it's a, it's a metal, it's a toxicity, and you, there's, you, there's research coming left and right anymore about fluoride mm -hmm. and different municipalities that are actually taking it out. Yeah. You had mentioned something about setting up some blood testing. For I'm still lab. working on that with LabCorp for the uh, arachidonic acid versus the EPA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know as soon as I get that done. Okay. So they're being slow on that deal. So we can buy pH strips from you guys? Yeah, we got them. They're like a couple bucks. You know, they're just a little... Is it strips. best just to do it one day or is it best to test? Well, you want to do like a few days and then write it down. You know, do like three days in a row. Because different things every day are going to... And then you kind of get an average you know, of how your... Uh, of what your, where your chemistry is at. How often should you do that? Um, you know, it's something that I just do like the once a year thing. I like to do it when I'm doing my cleanse. You know, because I guarantee you after a weekend, Friday and Saturday, that's when I choose my 10% of my meals that aren't good. I'm acidic. I guarantee it. And I've done it before and I've checked it. I don't need to check it. I know on Monday I'm not doing very good. You know, <laughs> or on Sunday. But as I start to get back into my reeling from the earth and hydration and everything else, when I'm in my scheduled work week and everything's uh, uniform and organized for me, in a sense, I mean, obviously we got family and it's not, I mean, it's not completely organized. But at least we're, we know where we're going to be for breakfast, and I know where my snack's going to be, and I, you know what I'm saying? It's easier during the structured work week. So then on the weekend, I am putting acid in my body. And that's okay. And everybody else can too. We just have to figure out what, I, I think I'm probably actually more 95-5. It, it's Friday night and Saturday night. And, but it's not every Friday and Saturday night, but it's most of them. <laughs> Honestly. But then the rest of the time, I, I'm waking up and having my clean breakfast, I'm having a snack, I'm having lunch, you know, I'm still exercising, I'm doing yard work, I'm being active, I'm hydrating, I'm getting my body back on track for Saturday night, because here we go again. <laughs> 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 but you're not, you don't eat far off, the, I mean, like you I might have an don't. ice cream and, and, I and maybe don't. a I'm beer. Not a, I'm, right? Luckily, I'm not a sweet kind of guy, <clears throat> mine's more going to be wine and beer. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Your wife might think you're a sweet kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what else? Other thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? Out of curiosity, you had mentioned fluoride. What's so wrong with fluoride? Or it's a metal. It's a, to it's a toxicity. It's like it's aluminum. Fun. What's wrong with but that? Well, what I'm saying is, you know, a lot of times I'll put it in toothpaste or... And then, so what I've read with the toothpaste, we can brush our teeth with that, but then you got to rinse your mouth and spit it out. Okay. So we don't need it in the water, but it can be in the toothpaste, that's okay. Brush your teeth, rinse your mouth with water, and spit it out. Okay. But obviously, what's... You want to talk about cavities? It's an acidic state. That's what causes it. The acidic state of the saliva and everything else is what eats the enamel off the tooth. That's the problem. It's not because you're eating candy. It, it is, but it's not because of the candy on the tooth. It's because mm -hmm. the sugar burns like lighter fluid in your body. It's really fast and it leaves acid behind and creates an acidic state. So the acid balance in the body is what creates the cavity. Ask the dentist. He'll tell you that. 
So then I have never done the experiment. I, we, hey, you know what? Grab that McDonald's bag. Let's see what that stuff looks like this month. Oh. Where is it? It's back there in that, but above the washer and dryer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Um, um, if I haven't done this experiment, but I'd like to do this one where you take a tooth, like if one of my kids loses a tooth that we won't lose anymore, and, think, and then put it in a Coke that's supposed to dissolve and go away. Oh. In like within a week, I think. I see the best toilet cleaner. Coke. Yeah. Well, porcelain. Toilet cleaner? Cleaning porcelain. That's, that's why the, the people. Battery. Off your car. And yeah, battery acid. And rust yeah, off your bumper bust. and rust off the bolts. And, you know, that's that's a very acidic thing. Okay, so this was 221.12. We bought this sad meal. Just the fries. 221.12. No mold. Everything looks like you'd buy it. This today at lunch. This is the cheeseburger. Two twenty one twelve. This is the cheeseburger. There's oh, there's some mold there that's coming probably from the cheese. Interesting. I don't think I'm gonna get the uh, burger away from the <laughs> bun, but from the outside, that's not moldy. Two twenty one twelve. What's today? Four seventeen. Four seventeen. So it's been two months. Yep. Yeah, so I'm gonna keep hold of this, and we'll look at this as time goes on. So remember, the reason why this is not breaking down and, and for the most part molding, especially the fries, is because why? Plastic in them. It's almost one molecule away from plastic, and there's no enzymes in it. It's it's enzyme robbed. It's not a real food. How do they take the enzymes out of the potato? It's it's just it's all the processing really. and the oil, the, the, I, the hydrogenated oil and the whole deal. It's one molecule away from plastic when the chem, when you look at the chemistry of it. I did this last week. I, I bought a, a meal too and it's been sitting and my son asked, can I eat it <laughs> later on? Yeah. There's a great video <laughs> that you can show your kids and they'll never eat McDonald's. About how to make, how they make chicken nuggets. Oh yeah, right. It's the pink block. Yeah. Yeah. So when they strip it and the whole deal, and then the ammonia. Yeah. And then, or it's it's a pink block, but then they put it and they almost have it like in a, um, uh, like a like a cake decorator would have that mm -hmm. squeezer mm -hmm. thing or, or a uh, the caulking mm -hmm. gun, caulking gun, and then they make it into this shape of a nugget. This is the one that Jamie Oliver did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My five year old watched it and. We drive past McDonald's every day to school, and she says, "Ooh, grind up chicken bone." Yeah. Yeah. And what's it called? It's Jamie Oliver. I bet it's Jamie Oliver and chicken nuggets. Yeah, uh, you probably he he had a show on for a little while that was the Food Revolution. Yeah. And he took a whole bunch of kids. Yeah, but if you go to YouTube and yeah. type in Jamie Oliver, okay. I mean you could type chicken in more stuff. Food yeah. Revolution, chicken nuggets, McDonald's chicken nuggets. I'm sure that it would pop up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Michael Pollan in his book. Uh, said that there are 42 or 43 ingredients Correct. in a chicken McNugget. Correct. And in the Chemicals. cheeseburger, it's more than that. I think it's close to like 70 or 80 chemicals. Really? They're do in a, the cheeseburger. Do you want to comment on, uh, Brian said stand on the BPS pink slime? Pink slime. <laughs> so, I mean, that, it's true what it is. You know, and so there was, you know, somebody brought this to people's attention and got it to the media. And with social networking, I love it because the information got out and about. And so it created many people to question the school, because the school, uh, the, what did they Los say? But the schools, yeah. the, the U.S. Uh, USDA. The, the USDA and the government bought like $70 million worth of pink slime for the school lunches. And so what that is, is the leftovers, and they call it, the lean meat remnants or something like that, that they grind up and then it's sprayed with ammonia. So they say to kill the E. coli and stuff like that, but nonetheless, just like the chicken nuggets, it's sprayed with ammonia and then whipped and, and ground and it's pink and it comes out just like the, uh, and they said, no, that's just, that's just normal and that's the way we've always done it and that's okay. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I need to call the locker in Redfield that, uh, butchers my half a grass-fed antibiotic hormone free cow every year and ask them, there's no pink, pink slime in mine. You know, the, those when they butcher that cow, those extra remnants go in the trash. They don't grind that up and spray ammonia on it at the Redfield Locker. They're not doing that. There might be some, some of the scrap that they do grind up to make the ground the hamburger, but it's, it's not very much. 
you know they did a study on the average school lunch and that happy meal has more nutrition in it than what our kids are getting at school. And pizza is yep. considered a vegetable. Yes. But they do have some really good things in school lunches. I mean they, they have they they provide um, grapes, they provide kiwi, they provide some good things, but the kids a lot of times kids don't eat them. That's, there are, and the oranges, yes, oranges right. are cut but into But as far fours, as the whole, the whole plate meal. of food that's available. Right, but they do provide some, because <coughs> I, let me tell you, I was, I was in the lunchroom as a teacher mm -hmm. for 15 years, mm -hmm. every day. Right. <laughs> but but, then, to, but to te that's, that's to my mind kind of a teaser, because the rest of the nutrition available right. on that plate is nowhere close. Right. You know, so then they can say, oh, but we have grapes and we have carrots right. on the plate and stuff and like carrots. that. Carrots, they'll have little carrots. And I say, things. big deal, because the rest of it's corn dog and fries and right. whatever. So, But then what parents send, too, is questionable. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's yep. terrible. Yep. And there's, art, yep. there's articles about that, bottles of pop and a bag oh of Doritos <laughs> and Wonder Bread. It's, and it's Yes, terrible. absolutely, right. It's so that's like, the problem. Oh. So that's why in one city, I think it was Detroit, they made it mandatory that they eat at school and eat school lunch because that's the kind of stuff, yeah. obviously, that some kids, some kids were showing up with. Not all of them because that's not, you know, what I would send. And obviously. then parents would call, some parents would call in and ask, would you check my, to see if my kid's eating the food? And be like, I've got 350 right. kids right. to deal I'm with. I'm supposed to, right. <laughs> exactly. You know, right. How I'll try. How am I try. supposed to do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. You know, so we have to make good choices is what we have to do. You know, and from the education that we're trying to gather with our active mind, not our open mind. Use your head. Make your own choices. Take my opinion as a second opinion. That's what I, this is just my opinion from what I'm gathering and reading. That's why we're doing this stuff, and you just take it as a second opinion. If it makes sense, apply it. If it doesn't, don't. Throw it out. Reel in from the earth, as far as nutrition goes. Hydrate. Water. Is there a book or something that, that or, or because you mentioned Dr. John Solomon and Dr. Alex Garrow. That information just comes from guys that have studied this guys stuff. Guys that, you know, that have studied, so that, I didn't yeah. know if there was something. You have a book list, you're reading this? Did you I'll, I'll get some of that out, yes, because you know a lot of the stuff that I read, you know, mm -hmm. paleo diet and, you know, what is that one that we read, the seven habits, or the, not, not the seven habits, the, the pillars, seven pillars seven of health. Pillars of health. Yep, mm -hmm. seven pillars of health. I mean, there's just, there's different ones, and his is, you know, it's just the same stuff. He's talking about water. He's talking about just, it's the same stuff, really. And isn't it, is it the China China study? study. Mm -hmm. China it's study. T. Colin Campbell. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's good, too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to read some stuff, there's lots of stuff. So, what if, what if, what if you're vegan or vegetarian? About what part of it? I mean, what, they should have protein. Correct. Of some kind. So. Correct. And it should come from wild caught fish, grass fed, antibiotic, hormone free beef, chicken, free range eggs. Yep. I'm not a fan of a complete vegan, vegan. or vegetarian because of the omega 3 fatty acids that they're mm -hmm. deficient in. Mm -hmm. Because of the walnut oils, virgin olive oils, flaxseed oils, avocado oils, it is alpha linolenic acid, and only 25% of it converts into a cosa pentanoic mm -hmm. acid. And that's what you need is EPA. And that comes from animal protein. Animal protein. Okay. A clean source. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready to break? Thank you.